internet, so we need to rank fast. Okay. So I uh, I lead data science organization within uh, in Equinor, and Equinor is an energy company. So we have oil, gas, and um, um, renewable energy, wind turbines, etc. Right. So our situation is different in the sense that we don't have customers and we don't have customer analytics and all these kind of things. Right. So machine learning for us is purely an industrial matter. Yeah. So let's keep that in mind because it's an important uh, area. The clicker is not clicking. I'll click here. So, um, like all traditional organizations, when they start doing machine learning, it starts by doing POCs and trying to build models to predict this or predict that. Generally, that is not something that gives you a good return on investment. Uh, it's very tactical, etc. Um, so the question for us as an organization was, how do we bring this technology, this new cutting edge stuff, into to become a competitive advantage for us, right? Bearing in mind that the world is changing around us, what does it mean? We, as, a, as an energy company, we have big machines and turbines, etc. Everything we see will be robotized, everything will be automated, or most things will be robotized, automated, and probably there will be autonomy, right? So how do we, how do we turn machine learning into a competitive advantage for us? The answer to that is we need to combine three things, right? So the first thing we need to have is some proprietary data. Yeah, so data only as can um, uh, own. The second element is we have knowledge, i.e. knowledge about the generation of that data, the use of that data, etc. Um, what information it may contain. And then the final element is changes in business process, i.e. you need to be able to generate, to embed machine learning or new ways of working while you are changing your business process to take advantage of these uh, technologies. There is, again, there is no point in introducing, in my view, machine learning in an organization like ours if you're not willing to change the way you work to make them happen, yeah? Okay, it's definitely not clicking. So, we as an organization, we are first of all transitioned from being an oil and gas company to being an energy company. We produce energy, wind turbines mostly, we are going into solar and so on. And that means, um, um, that means a lot for us, right? So, the, so, for instance, we expect, or at least I expect, that, that um, thank you, that that electricity will be sold directly to customers in the very near future, right? Instead of going through a, a complex value chain. As a company, to achieve that, we focus on three things. We think, focus on safety, what we call always safe. We focus on reduction of carbon footprint. Um, and we focus on high value investment. So we need return investment. And within the high value investment, we can think of primarily production, Right? So we want to produce two billion more, to, what's worth, what is worth two billion dollars uh, more uh, in value using digital technologies. One of them is machine learning AI. Um, automation of things like drilling and so on, plus autonomy. Yeah? So if we have autonomous, let's say, platforms, they will cost us at investment stage 30% less than what we build today, because we don't have you know, a kitchen and, and living quarters, etc. right? So, safety, low carbon, high value as an organization. We have a click. So, that translated into a decision or a choice to focus on four areas for us from a machine learning AR perspective, right? So, the first one is focused on knowledge. So, we have a team called Knowledge AI, which specializes in um, natural language understanding. And its primary f target now, its primary mission, is to reduce incident rates from a safety perspective just by gathering our knowledge and make it available to people who, are wor who work in dangerous situations, right? So in, on platforms, etc. So that's primary natural language understanding. The key challenge with that is Norwegian language. Um, you Swedish, maybe. <laughs> Any Norwegians? I'm going to hide, so <laughs> they, had, they don't have a language, that's what I understand, they have many languages. So when we come to try to understand uh, Norwegian in text, it's actually quite challenging. The second element is changing behavior and the sense of turning the company to be a lot more data-driven. 
right? So that's, that's people making decisions with data. Again, our main focus now is on the safety element. There are other areas we, 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 tr we, we work on as well, but our main focus is, is uh, uh, the safety element, and that is through insight. So we have the knowledge element, we have an engine that understands the history of incidents, that understands plans, activities, match them together and say, you want to paint that thing, you be careful because we have you may you may have incidents uh, or risks that you may not have thought of and we learned that from previous incidents the third area is machine data so we pump electricity we pump gas we pump oil and we pump a lot of sensor data so we have a huge number of sensor data being able to use the sensor data at scale is very important for us and the final element is reduction in capital investment and that's through autonomy yeah so again this year in particular, we are investing a lot in autonomy. So how can we turn a, a gas processing system into a completely autonomous system, right? Runs autonomously, reacts, etc., and self-learning. So we ended up with four teams just matching these, these three areas. And we ended up with the question is, okay, how do we work? So if we want to achieve all these things, if we want to get our knowledge out and be the best at using machine data, etc., how do we work? My basic principle, as we started with, is what I call the ROI fallacy when it comes to machine learning, right? So as I said, most traditional organizations, when they start on data science, machine learning, etc., what they will do is they will say, can you build me a model to do this? Can you build me a model to do that, right? Now, Anyone who uses machine learning here will know that that includes, you need to understand what the problem is. You need to get the data. You need to understand the data. You need to clean it. You need to try algorithms, blah, blah, blah. Right? That takes a lot of time. And if you produce a model, what value does that model have? Yeah? So the return on investment from doing one thing is very, very low. So what we want to do is we want to solve classes of problems with machine learning and then apply them many times with what we call Epsilon cost scaling, i.e., we solve a problem once, it takes us time. Yeah? We need to understand, as I said, the business, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we say, can we solve that problem in a general way so that we apply it so many times with the click of a button? And that's how we generate far more value. Yeah? The equivalent um, the equivalent analogy to that is becoming like car companies, right? So car companies, they will have a few chassis. So when you drive a car, you're on a chassis. So the thing that is at the bottom holding everything together, yeah? So they produce one and then they build tons of models on top, yeah? So that gives them scale, yeah? So you say, I will do the platform first and I will use that platform in several ways, yeah? And that's exactly how we think. So we think about machine learning, not about producing models, but, but producing a platform that generates lots of models. And the platform is technical, but also human, right? So we, have, we need a technical way to have scale, but we also need to have an interactive way, we as, as, as a data science team, to think scale and to do things very fast and scale them. Now we'll come to use an example, and hopefully that will, that will explain how we work a little bit more. So remember, one of our key investment areas is machine data. Yeah? So that is sensor data. So we have lots and lots of sensor data. If you take any piece of equipment we have, any process, we'll have sensors attached, which send us a signal every second. Yeah? Our engineers say there are 1.5 million useful sensors in the company. Right? And that's because they couldn't use all the sensors at scale. So the actual number is probably 6 million, 7 million, right? So we have 7 million sensors or 6 million, let's say 1.5 million that are really useful, that take every second, yeah? And the way we use them so far <coughs> is the engineers, hum humans, cannot manage too many dimensions, right? So they would say, okay, on the turbine, turbine is like jet engine, you know, when you fly that thing that compresses air, um, uh, and makes fl plane fly, we have many of these because they produce energy on platforms. So a turbine is complex, it has about maybe a hundred sensors, and they would say, for me to monitor that turbine, I cannot deal with a hundred sensors, I will deal with three, 
or four or five, and I will watch them and I will write few equations so that if if there's if something deviates, I say this turbine is not working properly. Right? I need to intervene on it. That's how we work. Yeah. However, it's a complex system, and we want to use all the sensors on it, so that we can predict whether that turbine is going to fail or not, or we can predict whether that turbine's performance is degrading or not. When a turbine goes down on a platform, the entire production stops. Yeah. And in offshore Norway, to our Norwegian friends, that's probably hundreds of millions of kroners a day yeah, cost. So we don't want that to happen. Yeah. So our question is, how can we use the sensor data to monitor processes, monitor machines, etc., at scale? I.e., we do not need to build the model manually for each one of these. So just turbines, we have about 125. We have thousands of compressors, pumps, blah blah blah. Right? We cannot sit down and write models for each one of them. So what we said is, can we build a process that is fast, that is scalable, that is general, that we can apply to any machine we have that has sensor data? That comes with a constraint, comes with a cost. So we have what we call design constraints on it. From an AI ML perspective, we have four main ch challenges with that. The first one is, our models must automatically find correlation between sensors and within sensors, right? So we have sensor data tick with time. So there is correlation within that time, yeah? So temperature goes up or goes down or is stable, whatever, yeah? But also, temperature and speed are probably correlated, yeah? So the faster the turbine moves, the, the hotter it is, for instance, yeah? Um, we need models that automatically detect this. So that's called, we need, we need really strong repres representation learning, and we need to do it automatically. We cannot sit down and code all these correlations from people's heads. The second element is models need to be uh, sensitivity variant, invariant. It means that if a sensor, one sensor breaks on a turbine, the model still works. Yeah? And then finally, sensors are signals, the time series, they take with time, so they bring information with them. They are literally um, uh, signals. So that gives us constraints that give us this process, this machine learning process. So what we do is we pick the, data, the sensor data, we do some pre-processing on the sensor data, we do some signal spect spectrum processing on the data, we run them through what's called autoencoders, so these are deep learning uh, uh, algorithms that try to predict the data itself. That will capture the, the relationships between the data. And then there's logic to say, and then what we do is the model is predicting itself. So you pass the sensor and then sensor data, 100 sensor data, it tries to predict 100 sensor data. And then the error between them tells us, mm, is this normal or not, right? So we put, we put a logic on top on that error data to say there's an anomaly or not. The turbine is running or a compressor, whatever, is running uh, normally or not. And then there's a the UX element. Now remember, we want to click a button, we want to do something and then build a large number of these models, right, without human intervention. So we have UX and technology constraints as well. We need to be able to build models that are, or the building of the models, the way people interact to build the models must be simple and flexible, because, believe it or not, we give this to the engineers to do, right, so we don't sit and code every model. Um, we need to build things fast, that run fast. Um, uh, both when, when we use the models, but also when we build them. And then we need to automate stuff going to production, right? And one of the big challenges with machine learning in terms of return on investment is that people do a lot on their desktops, putting things in production, i.e. being used by the business, being used by an end user, that's very difficult in most organizations. So we want to automate that process, which led us to some complex uh, architecture, but we use what's called Kubernetes, everything is a microservice, and then we automate the whole thing, right? So we have a DevOps process that help us to automate, and then we have technology that help us to run things uh, at scale. I'll show you a video now about how this, um, how this uh, product works. Everything is called Omnia.something, because Omnia is our data platform. Omnia.ora is our data science platform, machine learning platform. And what you'll see is Omnia.prevent, which is the instantiation of this, uh, of this uh, product that give us scale and give us much more return investment, because we run things automatically and at scale. 
So hopefully that explains um, how it works. That's a very old version, so now we are changing the user experience and so on and going all the way to dashboards automatically. Uh, but that's the idea. So we build once, general stuff at scale, push it to our colleagues in the business, and they run it themselves. Thank you for your attention.